Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, for coming today to this webinar that is part of the... Oops, just a second, please. There is an issue here. Just a second. So there is... Uh, Juliana, I see your face. Uh, um, uh, uh, Juliana, do you see her? Uh, what, what do you see on the screen, Juliana? I I just see my my PowerPoint. Wait, oh, I, don't know. I, I think I just fixed it. I think I just okay. fixed it. There well, we wait, go. Wait, because people are not seeing my presentation. Then just a second. Uh, uh, Julianne, uh, what we're seeing on our end is just the end of slideshow. Really? Okay. The point is yeah. that Juliana is not uh, the presenter. Wait, uh, make Juliana no cancel. Let me see. So I am the presenter, but for some reason uh, it's showing her her uh, her screen. Wait, let me see here. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, do you see now my screen? I mean the the slide with the uh yes. with the presentation name yes. yeah okay so something happened there a go to webinar problem uh, but anyhow we are we are back and uh, everybody uh, sorry for the for the confusion there there was a technical problem with uh, with our connection uh, but again uh, thank you everybody for coming to this uh, to this presentation this webinar that is part of the qualitative methods masterclass webinar series which is a partnership between the uh, Institute for Qualitative Methodology, I IQM, at the University of Alberta, Atlas TI, and the University of Georgia. We are now in our uh, seventh year of this, of this webinar series, and um, many of you probably have come to other presentations, and we thank you for that. And um, a few words uh, about the technical aspect of this presentation. Um, uh, uh, Julianne Scott Pollock will be speaking for about 40 minutes, more or less. While she is talking, uh, feel free to write down your questions in the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Okay, uh, there you can write down your questions, and at the end of her presentation, uh, she will proceed to answer those questions. Uh, and uh, the presentation is being recorded, and you're going to get. The video, the video of this about three hours after the presentation is over. And now I would like to ask my colleague from IIQM, uh, Juliana Barabas, to uh, introduce the presenter. Thank you so much, Ricardo and Atlas and the University of Georgia, always for the support of this ongoing series. Dr. Julianne Scott Pollock is a professor of communication studies at the University of North Carolina, Willing Wilmington. Her research focuses on personal narrative as performance of identity in daily life with a focus on stigmatized embodiment. She has published numerous articles that can be found in journals such as Text and Performance Quarterly, Qualitative Inquiry, Liminalities, a Journal of Performance Studies, and Departures in Critical Qualitative Research. Her book, Embodied Performance as Research, Art, and Pedagogy, is published with Palgrave Macmillan. She's the recipient of the National Communication Association's Ethnographic Article of the Year Award, Best Ethnographic Book Award, and the Best Book Chapter Award. Thank you, Dr. Pollack, or Scott Pollack. Thank you uh, so much, and I'm so excited to be here today to talk with you about uh, what I consider aesthetic research, uh, aesthetic research uh, that's made uh, to transform as well as to understand. Uh, one second, I think I have a little bit of a uh, show my screen. Okay, I think I think we're good. There we go. All right. Sorry for that. Here we go, and my slide is not advancing, so let me just figure that out. There we go. There we go. Okay. So uh, as you'll see here, uh, the idea of uh, the shift to interpretive inquiry uh, is really at the root of the sort of artistic research uh, that is made for both uh, for both 
traditional research audiences, as well as to be more accessible often for uh, general audiences as well to let our data reach uh, more people in society uh, beyond the traditional research articles and presentations. Um, it's important to think about this idea of this tradition goes back a long time. That idea of the, the hermeneutic tradition was this idea of focusing on the historical meaning of experience and how, uh, how, it, in, how it affects both individuals and societies on both a personal and a social level. At the core of that idea is this idea of, of a participatory relationship uh, for research that is a co-creation between a researcher and their participants, those interviewees, the cultures that we are, are observing. Uh, there's also an awareness that there are power relations and the meanings that come with interpretation and the fact that as researchers, as professionals, uh, we are at a socioeconomic status as well as an authoritative status that often uh, puts us at an advantage and in a position where people can feel less sure, uh, feel uncomfortable, and to be aware of that relationship and to make sure that we are having a participatory relationships, particularly because aesthetic and artistic versions of research are often shared beyond the academy with, others, with other audiences. And a lot of this arises out of this idea of a rejection of this idea that we can, as researchers, have a detached understanding of the world, this movement from being able to observe from afar, detached and predict, to instead move within under and understand. Okay, so uh, a lot of the questions I will get when people see uh, what I do is uh, they'll ask, why would we stage data? What comes from staging our data? Uh, and that idea of, I, I always love uh, Joni Jones when she says that uh, performance in artistic research allows for the exchange of knowledge across bodies. It's easy to reject a statistic. It's easy to look at a transcribed quote and say, you know what, I, I don't believe that, that's not real. But when that is a reality that is living in front of us, whether that is through someone sharing their own story through either live performance or documentary, or if it is sometimes that we have, we can sometimes have performers embody these stories for an audience and that way to allow, uh, to allow our participants to still remain confidential while having their stories shared allows an audience to feel those words, to see that experience, to be able to have that emotional connection that can feel detached from numbers or even words on the page. And uh, the ultimate goal of the research that I do, of all of us who do a lot of this critical sort of artistic work, is the pursuit of the utopian performative. And that idea of in that moment, we can glimpse what a world could be like where we were empathetic to one another, where those who are marginalized are heard and not only heard but included in society and able to give the support that they need. Oftentimes when I stage my data, I'll have audience members saying, I will never think about physical disability. I'll never think about memory loss. I'll never think about bulimia. I just finished my most recent show on seizure narratives. People said, now when someone says seizure, I have this wealth of understanding and experience of what that means to me socially and trying to understand where that person is coming from and what they're experiencing. And, and this is years and years of data collection but in that 40 minute show, how much an audience was able to learn from hearing those narratives with brief interpretation for cultural context. 
So the idea of moving through uh, to situate this research, because we come from lots of different uh, different paradigms when we when we enter a study. My favorite way to think about these paradigms comes from an organizational communication researcher named Dennis Mumby, and he has this idea of discourses and that idea of there's a discourse of representation that there's a capital T truth we are out there to uncover. Um, others might think of this as the positivist or post positivist uh, perspective perspective, that idea that we're going to have a hypothesis and we're going to pursue that hypothesis, prove it true or false, and come to at least a very close level of predicting overall human response and experience. Uh, there's also the discourse of understanding and that idea that truth is relative and personal. So while we might not be able to predict behavior, we can deeply understand the lived experience of people. And that's where this idea of bearing witness to another through qualitative research writing and, and also in the sort of artistic sort of work uh, that I do and my colleagues do. And then of course, the, dis the discourse of suspicion, often known as critical research, that we are going in not just to understand but to confront injustice, to see, uh, to be mindful of those differences in power and to work to allow those that are being oppressed or marginalized to, uh, to take up space, to have voices heard and to transform these, these structures of oppression. There's also the discourse of vulnerability and this is where a lot of my research comes from. And this idea, and, and part of this is because being a communication uh, professor and researcher, I believe that all truth, understanding, identity, and culture is formed through our daily encounters of our interaction. We become who we are through these interactions. We understand how others see us. We negotiate all of these different cultural power structures, but all of this meaning and understanding and truth is created through interaction and therefore it can be transformed through interaction and staging our data or putting it into a film form allows us this opportunity to reach more people to struggle over those meetings to reevaluate and create new understanding uh, so this idea too, just to give this idea of the shift to an aesthetic representation of data, uh, traditional forms of research that I'm sure you're aware of, um, ethnography, participant observation, and narrative analysis uh, comes, these uh, are rooted uh, in anthropology that we can observe a culture from a distance and have this detached kind of analysis. And there was this idea, you want to maintain that distance with a culture one is a cultural space one is observing or this person that we're inter we're interviewing because if we get too emotionally involved it's going to get in the way of having this objective intellectual academic analysis of this group or this or, or the or uh, this person who represents a cultural group uh, this somewhat comes from discourses of representation and sometimes understanding of, of, of just wanting to understand in order to communicate those meanings that shifts over to critical ethnography, autoethnography, and personal narrative performance. Critical ethnography isn't just there to understand, uh, it's there to connect, to become a part in order to be able to advocate and share the message that group would like to have shared. Um, autoethnography, I'll get that a little bit, that's seeing one's own story in culture and how that critical lens and that theoretical lens transforms personal storytelling into an academic endeavor. And then personal narrative performance. And that is this idea of embodying the narratives of research participants that sometimes can be the research participants themselves moving over into critical ethnography and sometimes can have actors or performers working with the researcher and the participants to stage these narratives in a way that allows those telling those stories to maintain anim anonymity and not have to, or confidentiality, I should say, because the researchers do know who they are uh, in this way so that they can share their meanings and share their understandings without taking on that vulnerable role of sharing their stories uh, from a public place. 
there is this idea this emerges um, from phenomenology uh, grounded in communication studies and informed by phenomenal and informed by phenomenology. There uh, is this idea of uh, also the discourses of understanding and also that shift because of the mindfulness of power relations and the ability to transform culture, moving to discourses of suspicion and vulnerability. One moment, oops. Um, just, and just a quick, uh, you know, we could have a whole webinar on existential, existential phenomenology and qualitative research, but that idea of when we say existential phenomenology, I'm coming from Amarillo Ponty, and that idea, uh, the focus on the body's lived knowledge uh, grounded in the blood, bones, and organs interaction with the world uh, that we are forever interpreting and making meaning. And there is that idea as we make this meaning with one another, we do have lived experiences and people who live through similar bodies with similar uh, in similar locations often have shared similar embodied experience. Good example, as I was interviewing, uh, when I did research with uh, bulimic women uh, back in the early 2000s, I was talking to white women between the ages of 18 and 25. Uh, they were mostly middle class, and there was this idea of a very shared experience of what it meant to live through a bulimic body. Um, now, so we have this idea, and as we begin this process of how does one create a story, one understand one's own story, one analyze someone else's story, uh, make that story through documentary work, there is this idea of uh, three tenets I like to think about when I think about story. This is, this is a heuristic I go by. Uh, visceral. This idea, um, visceral is of or pertaining to the viscera, that we do feel stories in our guts. There is a moment as we're moving through the world, there's a stab, a punch, a sink, a flutter that decides in all of my moments in this world, I'm going to section off this particular experience to remember and tell to another to struggle over the meanings and why this is significant. A storytelling is also uh, collaborative, and the and collaborative is uh, the roots of that word is to work, and it is work because telling a story is work, being an active listener and interpreter is work. The audience to our artistic uh, presentations of our data is doing work interpreting and understanding. And there is a way that we need to be mindful to ensure there is that work happening in that talk back session, in the way we're designing these performances and documentaries that someone is not easily able to become a passive voyeur of what's happening, and also that it's susceptible. And uh, some people will say here vulnerable, but the uh, the root of vulnerable is wounded. And I don't like to focus on the danger of telling a story or the pain of telling a story, though that can sometimes be there. But even when it's not there, every story is open to change, open to new interpretations, open to others telling it, interpreting it, and and contextualizing it in completely different ways. Also this idea as we're moving our stories to data, sometimes uh, for my seizure research, I have roughly 68 hours of transcribed interviews. And as I'm moving that data to the stage, there is this idea of, okay, who of these different people who I'm interviewing, which stories exemplify the themes and that this person can be an embodied accessible character in a short amount of time that works within a, within a, within a staged performance or a uh, adapted film version of the data. Um, note like it, making sure that the tension of the story is there, that there is a temporal moving of events in that particular part. We do want that interpret how I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, but there does need to be some sort of situation in the world that the audience can grab onto. And that there is a point, uh, uh, Ellis uses the point moral, but I, I like to think more of a message to the story. Uh, this is from Carolyn Ellis's book here, but that idea of a, of a message that why are we sharing this what is the audience going to understand about this phenomenological experience from the choice for us to include it in this performance or in this film? 
So really quickly, I'm going to go through autoethnography first um, and this idea, what is uh, the purpose of autoethnography? Because we use it in a lot of different ways. Uh, what lens uh, do you bring to the project? Uh, why does it matter to you? How are you interpreting it? In this way, we can often think of autoethnography as what we've always known in rigorous, good qualitative research as self-reflexivity, that we need to know uh, why we're here, our relationship to this data, why were we asking these questions to these people, why were we spending time in this cultural space, because that idea of an qualitative research, it is our bodies that are conducting these interviews, observing the cultures and people want to know who we are and why we're there and what lens we're coming to interpret it from because we are from this hermen hermeneutic tradition we're not trying to say that we are this detached observer we are a body living and making meaning with other bodies and culture we also, at times, uh, I often, I started with autoethnography to have rigorous self-reflexivity in my work. That's where autoethnography emerges mostly in my most recent book. Um, but it also helps us understand ourselves because stories are how we make sense of experience and to figure out and think about why does this story matter to me? What does it say about my location, the culture I'm in, and the relationship to other people? So that idea when we understand ourselves. It's hard to understand ourself without contextualizing that and also understanding the culture. And when we're understanding the culture, it moves us beyond ourselves to our relationships with these other characters in the story and the audiences we're wanting uh, to share them with. And, and there's also this idea of have others understand one themselves through the story. Oftentimes, those are who are the most moved in this kind of research are people who see themselves or people they know embodied through this research. The amount of people that came up to me after the most recent uh, performance I had or sent to emails or left phone messages said, I knew someone with seizures or I have seizures and just being able to hear my story on stage for other people makes me feel so much more connected and seen in this world with hope that others can understand and support. So, and, and just this idea of why autoethnography, just to break down the word, it is uh, auto is the self, ethno is human beings and culture, graphy is the field of study. Uh, it's the study of one's own humanity and this idea of gazing back and forth to culture, seeing the struggle to create and resist meaning. Uh, that's what moves it from a memoir to a research method is that theoretical and cultural lens that helps us understand not only ourselves, but the cultures we're in and our relationship to other people. Um, there are different in that idea too. Uh, there is that personal autoethnography um, as well as that narrative autoethnography that we talked before, adding ourself as a character in an ethnographic study. I've done that quite a bit. And then that idea of looking back through research, how have I changed? Uh, sometimes this can be called meta autoethnography when we look back at ourselves as researchers across many different projects. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to performing personal narrative research, um, embodying research participants on stage or in film. Um, the idea of when we think about performing uh, uh, personal narrative research is this idea that it is a co-creation between the researcher and the participants. Uh, embodying someone else's story on the stage or in film is a loaded and complex endeavor that level of connection one has to have to those words, to that body that told that story to honor how it was told, who told it, and why it was told. So there is this, this idea. I recently had some of my upper level undergraduate students uh, embody these seizure narratives, and they took an entire course to learn the history of seizures. Uh, when I gave them the script, I left every um, every ah, uh, every false start to a sentence, every pause in there so they could feel that person's words on the page and to see it. And there is also performative transcriptions that do move to new lines, have every pause, the researchers uh, 
interpretation of each of those intents to help performers to embody those stories if actually listening to the story is not an option. For my students, listening to the story is not an option because I need to preserve confidentiality. And when you give somebody someone else's words, I'm without editing out a lot of the different uh, a lot of the different people they spoke to and sometimes people even have very unique voices that means that's just not an option uh, that I have when I'm embodying it myself, but not something when I'm giving it to performers to embody. And also that idea of being aware of the power relations and the meanings that come with that interpretation. Uh, and so that idea of remembering that there isn't a single reality, there's multiple realities. And even if we disagree with a participant or we're skeptical of a participant, that in itself is telling and sharing that story with that push and pull back and forth of that struggle to create meaning is part of that process. Um, and that idea too, that we do have an ethic of social justice, we can start thinking about this as well, what is right and wrong, uh, but there is an idea of what is right when we're coming from this critical eth ethnographic or personal, uh, personal performance. Um, we are compelled to act morally um, and that idea to make a difference in the world, to contribute to the quality in life and enliven the possibilities for those we study. So this isn't just about us. It's not just about the pursuit of understanding. It is a pursuit of transformation, of being able to help share the message our participants want shared, uh, not necessarily just our own interpretations and a conscious avoidance of exploitation. It can be very tempting when a story is shocking or really interesting or really uh, and or is told with such animation to want to share it just for the sake of the data but to always remember it's not just about the data it's about the person this is just quick these are the age-old traps from 1985 uh there is uh that there is this idea that sometimes when we're doing this, and I run into this sometimes when I have students, especially doing uh, doing this kind of work, is well, we can never really understand. So if we can't understand, I'm just not going to even bother trying to understand. I'm just going to do it. And uh, that idea of if if we're not rigorously trying to have this connection and participation to share this understanding, uh, then we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, there is this idea of the custodian's ripoff. Uh, I want to create a project for personal gain. Uh, listen, I need tenure or I need a degree and this is what this is about. Uh, and, and that idea of like we need to, at that point, uh, we can be risking exploitation of people rather than uh, connection and, particip and, and participating in creating meaning. Uh, enthusiast infatuation, and I think wonderful people can fall into this. I'm just so enamored. Can you believe this? Really, we're all alike. I have this deep connection that we really are one. Um, and that's not true. As rigorous as my students were trying to understand what it meant to live with seizure disorders, all but one of them did not. And that idea of realizing there will always be a distance and having that respect to honor that we are getting as close as we possibly can, but in that ways, we're always falling short. And that uh, understanding is what keeps us with rigor in being ethical uh, and ethical in our presentations. There's also the curator's exhibition, and that's just the desire to shock rather than empathize. Rather than to, than empathize. So rather than empathize, wanting to share these means, create connections, it's just wowing people at this absurdity because it makes good it, you know it, it makes good performance or it makes good film and uh, that's not what we're in this for uh, so that idea um, that I'm remembering that embodying stories from marginalized groups is complicated and I feel we're much more aware of this complication than I would say Dwight Conker good the founder of critical performance ethnography was in the 80s and 90s uh, it takes rigor and care uh, sometimes it just needs to be avoided. Um, at this point, uh, I will not allow, I myself and my students, uh, I'm, a, I'm a white, uh, I'm a white uh, straight woman. I will not in any way uh, perform uh, an accent of a marginalized, a, a group that, an ethnicity that is marginalized in our, in our culture. Uh, I also, uh, so I'm, I'm careful of that, of be, being in a body of privilege. I don't have the leeway that some other ethnographers might feel because they are in, uh, of an in-group 
and my students had to run into this uh, when we did Cripping, which was a performance ethnography that we did a film version of that. Uh, we and they were uh, embodying people that identified as physically disabled. And while we would restrict movement, we definitely did not do uh, skeptic, uh, the spectacle that could come from putting them in braces or canes or wheelchairs or simulating limps. We we just told the story uh, as much as we could with as much authentic authenticity uh, as we as we ha as we could in that space, as opposed to trying to create uh, more of a background. Um, and that idea of creating a set or using a lot of props to simulate disability. We did a very similar kind of thing with seizing. Of course, like we did not simulate seizures on stage. We just had them tell the story as it was told. Uh, one story uh, was to, was a, a, a person of color who said, I really would feel uncomfortable if a person of color did not embody my narrative. And knowing that, I ensured that that was the case. Uh, a similar thing and with Mary, memories that matter. These were elders. Um, I wasn't going to myself. I am not, an, I do not identify. I am not an elder, and neither are my students. So we told the stories with emotion, without uh, trying to sound older in a way that could be skeptic, that could be a spectacle. Now, moving to documentary, instead of embodying these narratives and all the complexity that comes with embodying another person's words uh, and that care that it takes to really honor the emotion and the delivery and the intent that is there, uh, a documentary allows the, allows the participants to speak to the world themselves in their own words, which can be wonderful um, as long as it is participatory and that they are helping create this documentary and are able to have uh, a say in what message is coming out uh, of this work. Uh, also allow the story to emerge. We often go into research thinking to ourselves that we have a story that we're expecting to tell, perhaps because we have a connection or consider ourselves an insider. But sometimes things take us in different directions and it's not what we expected. And it's and that idea of allowing the story that comes to be the story that is told, that story that emerges. And because uh, sometimes it can be tempting because with editing, we can sometimes make a story into something else. And this falls into something we can also do with uh, when we're doing the performance of personal narrative. We can take an excerpt from that narrative and give a different understanding without the context of where it was delivered. Uh, course we see this happen in journalism all the time that is uh, that is unfair and that idea of being just in wanting to be participatory and engaged and empathetic and also uh, being willing to be an advocate but not an advocate for our own agenda but the agenda of those that we're working with also uh, honoring the desire for confidentiality sometimes especially if we're within a community for a long time it can be easy for the person to feel so connected to us because we've been in that space a long time. This happened when I was spending a lot of time in a retirement community that someone who fe who feels a bit anxious at first is like, well, if it would make you happy, if it would make, if it would be helpful, even though I feel vulnerable, even though my instinct for me and my family is not to appear, I think I will anyway. And that idea to, to honor that desire for confidentiality, because if someone feels that fear, that fear feel could be real and legitimate. Um, there's ways, of course, um, if we see a heart broken in half, which was uh, a critical uh, film ethnography done by Dwight Conkergood in the 90s. He did a lot of work to allow uh, people to be blurred and to all, so that people would not know who they were and to allow them to say, I don't want that particular interview included. And he honored those ideas. Also, there's always wonderful to give compensation when we can um, and share the success to remember that oftentimes it's those of us who are making the performance, writing the book, uh, making the documentary to get all this notoriety and to share um, as much of that success as we can monetarily with our participants, and if they do not desire confidentiality, to also give them uh, that recognition and opportunity. Uh, with that, I think I've finished about five minutes early, so I guess we have a little bit of a little bit more time for um, for, for conversation. 
Uh, I have on there my, uh, my email as well as my cell and my work phone. Um, I, and I also there is a quick copy of my book uh, where most of this comes from. So if uh, I'm excited for questions. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, anybody has any questions? We do not have any, any written questions yet. However, uh, if you would like to speak, go ahead and click on the hand icon next to your name in the go to webinar control panel. If anybody would like to ask a question, let me see here. Yeah, I have one. Uh, um, and uh, Sepan Dharmas, Sepan Dharmas, that's her name, and, and I apologize if my pronunciation of your name is not correct, uh, uh, ask, is asking what kind of performances are there? What kinds of performances are there? Yeah, well, there's that is a, what uh, this person asks. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different kinds. Um, what I would say, some of I would say the most uh, well-known ones that I imagine you've heard of, and I have this and I forgot in my notes and I forgot to say it, so I'm glad you do. If you've heard of Anna Devere Smith, Anna Devere Smith has had decades of uh, of work in performance ethnography, uh, being on on stage, and she has from everything. Uh, from uh, the Ro the Rodney King uh, beat uh, the Ro when Rod the Rodney King beating followed by the riot that happened after it, and she interviewed a lot of different people um, in that space. Uh, she did another one called uh, she did another one more recently that was on that I was very that's called Let Me Down Easy, which was uh, an investigation of our healthcare system where she interviewed people all over the nation. Uh, this was before the Affordable Care Act and really was able to give the complexity from doctors and nurses to individual patients navigating um, our healthcare system. And she embodied each of those voices herself, which I thought was just wonderful, uh, her ability to do that so well. Uh, and uh, she was also, will do a lot of uh, different accents um, as well as it, in dialects and embodiments. And in some ways, I think as a woman of color has a bit more leeway to do that than perhaps I would as a white woman who would be more worried about that uh, risk of, explo of exploitation. Um, another one that is lovely, and I don't think it is released in full video yet, um, but it really is, uh, but it's such a strong, um, if you've ever uh, seen a Black Sweet Tea by E. Patrick Johnson uh, is a marvelous uh, uh, personal narrative performance. He um, is a, a, a black gay man who is a professor at uh, Northwestern University. And he traveled all around the South interviewing um, black gay men. And he has a beautiful performance that he does. It's about an hour that is uh, of the hundreds of interviews he conducted. He embodies nine of those characters. Um, and it's this really complex, beautiful look uh, going from uh, participants as young as 18 right up to participants uh, as old as uh, 95. I think uh, some of uh, some of the uh, ones when I think of when we look at the video ethnographies that have been done, Heartbroken in Half that I mentioned uh, by Dwight Conkergood is uh, such a strong, uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful piece. Uh, Paris is Burning that is a, an older film has just recently got a resurgence and is going to also uh, be put out there and a lot of, uh, well, that is a traditional documentary work that idea of participatory and the co-storytelling and all the tenets and ethics that we have in this kind of work are, are there in that, in that work as well. Uh, there's also some researchers that have been doing, uh, uh, some younger researchers. I've been really interested um, in the work of Colin Whitworth, who is at the University of South Florida. He just got his PhD and he interviewed um, white gay men in the South, and he interweaves autoethnography and that he tells his own story as well as his interactions with his participants in some really interesting ways. 
Thank you very much. Let me see. Um, we have another one, Nicole. And in fact, you know, I could offer your the microphone to you so that you can uh, speak. Uh, let me see if you are available for the microphone. I'm going to open your microphone, and if you can speak, uh, please uh, introduce yourself, uh, where you come from, and then ask your question. Nicole? Well, her microphone is muted, therefore, I will ask the question for her. And the question is, uh, what can a researcher do when interviewing participants who are older or elderly and their narration of an event is completely different from one another? Well, that idea when they're, well, I think that's actually the most powerful finding in that ways of remembering that how we remember and how we do memory is not a, po a positivist science model. There isn't a capital T objective truth that we might like to think about this idea of people tell stories because of their own motivations and their own way of remembering and what about that event stood out to them, or what about that event they want to remember and what they want to be able to tell others. When I was interviewing elders and I with memory loss, I was, a lot of times their, uh, their children and their spouses would say, that's not really how we remember the story. But what we do see is that is what this person wants us to know and remember about their values and what mattered to them. So in so many ways, we tell the story to mirror our own sense of what matters. And in so many ways, we learn so much about two different people by how they choose to narrate an event. And that I think is the difference between a narrative researcher seeking to understand how one chooses to perform and narrate their identity as opposed to an investigative journalist who is looking for a capital T truth. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being an investigative journalist looking for a capital T truth. I deeply value it in our political landscape. Um, but I'm interested in how bodies harbor this knowledge and how bodies tell their stories. And I feel I learned so much about a couple's dynamic by the different ways they choose to tell the stories they tell. OK, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, anybody else would like to ask a question? You may click on the hand icon next to your name in the go to webinar control panel. Or you may write down your question and, and we have another one, Maggie. Maggie, would you be uh, okay if I offer you the microphone? It's because you have a long question and perhaps would be better if you ask, her, if you ask it yourself. I'm going, to, I'm going to try, uh, Maggie, unmute. You are unmuted, Maggie. If, if you can speak, could you introduce yourself and ask your question? Well, no, the microphone is not working. So once again, uh, I will go ahead and, 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 uh, and read the question. So this is the question. Uh, what have you encountered with IRB? That is, I have already secured IRB, collected data, written a journal article, and now I would like to move uh, to dissemination uh, to to, uh, to move dissemination to this method. Uh, does one still need to get IRB approval? Uh, what do you think? If one is planning to do this prior to IRB submission, how where do you address it? Well. In prior submit, and when I've uh, always had this embedded into my IRB, because this is a, a method that I was trained in from the beginning, but I have, but since moving here, I've uh, been working with this idea of scholars who have this shift to performance and what to do. And the important thing to understand, if it is not already in your IRB, the important thing to understand is that all of the promises of confidentiality 
need to continue. So that idea is if you're wanting performers to perform the data, but you said in your IRB that you are not going to let anybody hear voices but you, then they can't hear the voices. And I keep that in my data regardless, just because I want to protect my participants because I do, I do research stigmatized embodiment and people who are experiencing marginalization. And I don't want to ever put them in a vulnerable position. I can control what I do with their identities. I can't really control what other people do. So for that reason, I only give my performers transcripts that uh, that go beyond that go to my IRB with all personal data removed from it. So there's no names. I change the places. Um, if they give me an, a particular region of the country that I'm worried that you know I, I need to change that to, whatever I need to change to protect that participant, I always do. And have the and then how I work with instead is because I do a very close transcription, every um, every ah, every pause, my interpretation of the emotion, I can still help rigorous performers do very close embodiments of this data. But as long as your data is not in any, as long as you are not. Uh, giving people voices or identifying information when you said you would not, as long as any uh, narrative they are performing is the same uh, is in the same verbatim uh, presentation as it would have been published in writing. Then my IRB is very comfortable with this different kind of dissemination. It would be no different than reading a narrative aloud in a research talk, which our IRBs cover. Thank you very much. Let me see. I have another one. Just a second. How do you reconcile hermeneutics and autoethnography and, and as well bracketing bias? Huh. I, in so many ways, bias is not, uh, is not something in my work I am ever trying to pretend is not there. So there is this idea of when I'm doing when I'm doing my work, of course I'm biased, and you're biased, and every person is biased. There is no objective person because we all live in the world, and as we live in the world, we have experiences that create values, understandings, and interpretations that are never removed from qualitative research because it is our bodies that are conducting this analysis. So in this idea of I'm going to tell a story owning that this is my perspective and my understanding of, and that understanding is coming from my cultural location and what you're learning from my story is the, the, the existential phenomenological experience of a body situated in culture. So that idea of I'm not, so that idea of owning those biases, and I try my best to be really reflexive. If I'm having a knee jerk reaction, I always try to think, I always am working as a, as a good qualitative researcher that believes in rigorous reflexivity to work as hard as I can to understand other and possible other interpretations while owning that this is my position and that I'm coming at through rigor and through my critical and methodological lenses uh, to understand. And I think that's the important thing. And I think that's important uh, to be aware of as we're uh, doing this work. I would say when autoethnography isn't good, it usually means uh, we, we have a joke, we call it about, we say uh, when autoethnography ends up in this sort of navel gazing place where all we're doing is airing gripes or uh, communicating injustices or trying our best to make ourselves look as valiant as possible, what, that usually is not good 
autoethnography. People don't like it. People don't resonate with it. Uh, and it ends up uh, usually not getting, I would say, perhaps in the very early stages of autoethnography, perhaps that navel gazing as people were figuring out this method uh, was more prominent in getting the, those early publications. But I would say the level of rigor, rigor now has people owning bias, doing their best to see things from other ways, but also knowing that what autoethnography does is gives you a deep understanding of a particular body in a particular cultural location making meaning with others. Thank you. I have Susan uh, Cox asking, do you ever have your participants performing their own stories in your work? I have not had my participants perform their own stories in the work, but only because I've never had a participant at all interested in doing so. Uh, if a participant wanted to perform uh, or be in a or, or to perform their narrative in a sh in one of my shows, I would love that. Uh, I think it would be great. Um, the participants I work with, uh, being in marginalized situations, they want their story told. They don't want the vulnerability of telling it themselves. In fact, I would say in one of my earliest performances on bulimia, there was actually an audience member who said allowing these women to tell their stories to you with your complete non-judgmental empathy in so many ways did it validate for them that this very harmful behavior was okay and that they weren't having that they could uh, do this this interview in secret uh, like they binge in secret, and then they can just tell you all about it and indulge in the storytelling, much like a purge. Are you really just replicating this awful behavior through allowing them to tell the story without confidence and without any kind of medical uh, professional opinion pushback? Because I'm not a medical professional. My PhD is in communication and performance. It is not in medicine. Um, and my answer to that was, I don't think people should have to put their bodies on the line in order to have an empathetic, real connection of their stories with an audience. So that is uh, that is my position. And uh, the same thing with that I was I my next study, I interviewed people that self identified as physically disabled professionals and a lot of things they were telling me, you know, they could get fired for talking about their jobs the way, the way they were talking about it. And some of them talked about their sex lives in really intimate ways that they felt that people needed to understand that this was what it was like to be intimate or what it was like to be professional through their body, but they wouldn't want that, want, want to share that themselves because of the social risks of doing so. The same reason why they want confidentiality from my IRBs. And I would say uh, similar ideas to uh, people that live with seizures, say that idea of not wanting to go on record just because they're not sure what kind of jobs they're going to be doing or if their licenses can be revoked for admitting having seizures, different reasons why people would just rather keep things uh, confidential. But if there was a person who did not feel that way, I would be excited to have them participate. I haven't run into anyone interested in embodying that kind of role at this point. Thank you very much. Any, of, any other questions? Anybody would like to ask a question? You can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon next to your name in the control panel. We, we don't have more questions, but sometimes questions come up at the last minute. Let's, let's, let's wait for a, a few seconds. And in fact, we're getting closer to uh, the end of the session. Um, so since we do not have more one. questions, would you like to add something, uh, Julianne? Just one thing, like, I'm forgetting the name of, of the woman thinking of staging data. One thing I did not say uh, for anyone considering staging the data is it's often tempting to have elaborate sets in that sort of thing. Um, I actually, I think, made this mistake in my, uh, when my students performed some of the, the elder narratives, we tried to sort of recreate retro sets kind of going back in time. And I feel like to remember, 
that because uh, the idea is to connect to the story, that oftentimes an elaborate set allows the audience to become more voyeuristic. And in so many ways, uh, think of it idea as something that's not real, that's cinema, that, that idea of a black box stage, a more simplistic kind of film, if you're going to have people embodying narratives that explicitly says before and after that these are performers, performing these narratives verbatim to make sure people don't miss that uh, can be the better way, uh, the safe, I won't, I won't say better, can be an ethically safer way to do this complicated work of embodying the stories of others for an audience. Thank you very much. And since we only have four, min four more minutes to go, I would like to start closing the session. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And before we say goodbye, though, I would like to offer the microphone to my colleague from IIQM, uh, 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 Julianne. Would you like to say, uh, Juliana, any 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 last uh, wo closing words about um, maybe some uh, events that are going on at I IQM? Absolutely, Ricardo. Thank you so much. And Julianne, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Good to be reminded about Paris is Burning. I'll be looking it up again. Uh, here at IIQM, anyone who's interested in any of the archives of this masterclass series, you can find those on our University of Alberta website. If you go there and search IIQM, you'll be able to find the webinar archives as well. We have another webinar in this series coming up on December 4th with Jennifer Wogelmuth, the what's, hows, and whys of qualitative systematic reviews. Uh, interestingly, we also have a webinar company coming up in Japanese on December 18th with with another partner, MMIRA. So if you have any colleagues who speak Japanese, that presentation will be given in Japanese. If you happen to be in the Edmonton area, we have three more workshops in our Fall Qual series, two coming up this Friday with Karen Olson, inter qualitative interviewing and mixed and multi-method design, and another on Friday, the no November 29th with Erica Goebel, an introduction to applied research, managing the messiness. Ricardo, thank you for giving me a few moments. Thank you very much, Juliana. Uh, thank you very much, Julianne, for your presentation. And, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, this uh, webinar series has been going on for uh, eight years. We're now going to, into our ninth year. And uh, the success of this series is possible because of your participation. So please always tell your students and uh, share this with your colleagues. So thank you all of you for 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 here for coming today. Uh, Julianne, would you like to say goodbye to the audience? Um, goodbye, and thank you so much uh, for spending this time with me. Thank you very much. I, uh, you and I'm begin... excited to hear from you. Okay, okay. So okay. everybody, I, I I interrupted her, but she would be excited to hear from you. So the, her contact information is on the slide and you will be receiving the, the video of this presentation about three hours from now. And if you do not see it, go to your spam folder. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye.